Let us pray. Oh, Father God, we ask that you certainly would send the light as you already have. That you would remind us also that as we sing that part of sending the light for us is being the light. To be the light as Jesus has called us to be. Recognizing that, yes, we are an inferior light to him. The true light that shines in the darkness. Nevertheless, we are to shine. We are not to hide away because the world gets darker and darker. But we are to shine. Knowing that as the world darkens around us, as our culture decays, as sin increases, that dim light that we are blessed to be shines even brighter and allows people to see just a glimpse of the true and wonderful light that is your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you would help us in every way to be like Him to pursue righteousness, to pursue holiness, to chase after the things that are good and true and beautiful in this life. And Lord, I ask that you would help us to do that now, in this moment, in this time of worship and this time of gathering. Father, help us to refuel and to recharge and to heal ourselves as we prepare for the fight ahead. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Would you join me as we turn to Ephesians chapter 4 for the scripture reading this morning? Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verses 1 through 7. Ephesians 4, verse 1. I therefore... A prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace that has been given to us, grace that allows us to find in Christ our salvation, our deliverance, freedom from sin, to find in Him forgiveness for all the things we've ever done wrong and all the things we will ever do wrong. And Lord, I'm thankful for that grace that also allows us to be united with you, Lord, to be united with your Son, to be united with each other. Lord, that call here from the Apostle Paul, that we be eager to maintain unity, is a calling that echoes in my mind so often, Lord, as I constantly wrestle in this life, with how to remain united with my brothers and sisters who are so often different from me, often different in a good way, often difficult ways, they're different. But Lord, I pray that you would help us all to maintain that unity, that today we would come to understand all of the blessings that Paul says right there of having one faith, of having one Lord, of being part of one body as we seek to exalt you, Lord, our one Father. Lord, as we stand in your grace, Lord, I want to pray for some of those who are struggling, 
Lord, I pray for Jack and Elaine, who are gone with some headaches this morning, but specifically for Elaine, who has a venograph coming up, scheduled for the 13th. Lord, I pray that that test would go well, that there wouldn't be issues with it, and that the doctors and the medical professionals would be able to use that to properly assess things, diagnose things, and plan uh, for what's needed to help Elaine push through and uh, to keep going. Oh, Lord, I, I also pray for uh, Merlin, our dear brother, who will be having a, a knee replacement uh, on the 2nd of April. Lord, I pray for uh, his time of preparation for that. I'm thankful, Lord, for uh, you bringing Merle into these pews uh, to share some of his history and his life with us. And I'm thankful, Lord, that he would be able to open up to us about that. Uh, Lord, help us to, to serve uh, Merle as he recovers as needed, and, and let that uh, relationship of openness continue, Lord. I also ask that you'd be with Vicki and Donna. They're gone this morning because of car troubles. Uh, Lord, I know I've certainly missed uh, church and the ministry here for car troubles before. I know that can be frustrating, but Lord, I pray that you would uh, set them straight there and get that fixed uh, appropriately and, and soon, Lord. And I also want to pray for myself, uh, Lord, as I'm not feeling well this morning and uh, am struggling uh, physically uh, with some stomach issues. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would help to give me strength to press on. And that as always, as the word is preached, that there would be less of me and more of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you would be honored and exalted through our time of preaching and worship to come. Lord, for all these things and in all these requests, we come humbly before you in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A couple of announcements. Um, a couple of people I heard asking about Elise. Elise was sick last week. This week she's feeling better. She just has a cough and the kids convinced her not to come to church just because of her cough. Uh, I was in the other room and I could hear saying, I feel better. Does it sound that bad? And the kids were like, yeah, it sounds pretty bad. So, uh, so she's, she's home. She's feeling okay, but that cough's still there. So, uh, she's staying away and, and helping to keep the volume down a bit, I guess. But, uh, that's an update for her. Uh, I was just handed this, a uh, little flyer for a Grace Believers Conference at Croton Community Church. Uh, April 20th and 21st. Um, uh, it's probably a Saturday and Sunday. It could be a Friday and Saturday. I'm not sure. Uh, just seeing this, um, but something to be aware of. We had a little bit of time, and I'll announce it some more. Uh, some of the names for people who will be speaking. We've got uh, Tim McGarvey. We've got Dr. Phil Long, one of my professors from school. Brilliant man. Uh, Pastor Mark Wright, Dr. Robert Nix, a few other uh, good names on there. So good times of teaching to come there. I uh, keep that in mind. But most importantly, uh, what I want to emphasize is uh, another wonderful time of teaching, and that's the ladies' Bible study that's coming up. If you are interested in that, this first meeting for that will be this Thursday. There's information there under the reminder section in your bulletin. Uh, this Thursday, it's first week at 1 p.m. here. Pam will be leading that. If you haven't talked to her yet and you're interested in that, let her know. Have that conversation. She has uh, a few extra books, some resources uh, to give to you if needed. So, uh, yeah, please let her know if you're interested so she can plan ahead. And I know that'll be a great time. And I know I'm pretty jealous. Uh, I won't be able to truly uh, appreciate what's happening there. But I know that'll be good. And uh, trust the Lord will bless uh, the ladies who are able to attend that. So, yeah, keep that in mind. This Thursday, 1 p.m. And uh, that's it in way of announcement. So I'm going to turn it back over to the worship team to continue leading us in worship this morning. Throughout our swim in the deep waters of the pool that is Paul's letter to the Galatian believers, we see a springboard that allows us to jump into the waters of a broader topic. In our swim, we've been looking for those springboards. Uh, 
that allow us to focus on the eight different essentials of mid-Acts dispensational theology, which is the theological and hermeneutical framework by which I and many of us here understand the Bible. Today we dive into, and, and I think this is where the pool and the springboard analogy really work, we dive into the topic of baptism. Now this is a topical sermon, meaning I will not be looking at one text and teaching an in-depth uh, summary of what it says. Instead, we'll be looking at one topic, the topic of water baptism. And we'll see many verses that add clarity to that topic. I'm trying to show you the biblical case for the position of the GGF, of this church, and myself. And to prove it, I need proof. I need scriptural proof. In other words, what I'll be doing today, in large part, is proof texting, which is a dangerous game to play, really. But it's also something that's necessary, this proof texting. It's necessary for good biblical systematic theology. Anytime you're doing systematic theology, there's proof texting that takes place there. But that's also something that can be done to justify all manner of false beliefs, from bad opinions to utter heresy. And so it's your obligation, it's your responsibility, as it is with every other message of mine, but I'm trying to make it extra clear today, it's your responsibility to be like the Bereans, to test everything I say against Scripture. And this might be especially important today when you consider that the view I'll be expressing is held by less than 1% of Christians. But I don't base my views on what other believers think or the majority. I base my views as best as I can on Scripture. So back then to the springboard. And that springboard that we found last week, I mentioned it a bit last week, is Galatians 3, verse 27, where the Apostle Paul uses the word baptized. In Galatians 3, verse 27, it says, For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now, I... Because I'm going to be using a lot of different texts, and by a lot I mean really a, a thinned down list of what I originally planned on using, uh, I, I printed off, and hopefully you all got one of these. If you didn't, let me know. I've got extra. Uh, but in the bulletins, I had Adrena put uh, some of these verses that I'll be referencing uh, or reading directly. Uh, they're there in sort of book order, so Old Testament and New Testament on there. Uh, I use the English Standard Version since that's what I'm preaching from, so you have the words that I'm using. Uh, but of course, you can take this and, and add it to, uh, or look it up in a translation you prefer and uh, make that part of your studies later. But I want to make sure everybody had one of those. Uh, it's important, I think, to be able to see the text, and I didn't want us jumping around too much, because I know that's hard to keep up sometimes. But what we have here is really quite interesting. There in Galatians 3, verse 27, For as many of you were, as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Most people reading that, I mean 99% of people reading that, are going to read that, and in their mind's eye, they're going to picture water baptism. But that instinct betrays the entire thrust of what Paul is trying to teach us in Galatians and many other epistles. In this context of Galatians, it is impossible that Paul could be talking about the ritual of water baptism. Paul had argued throughout the book that the ritual of circumcision has no spiritual value in the present dispensation, the present age. It would undercut his argument entirely if he now claimed that baptism had some sort of spiritual value. If circumcision has no value for salvation, then neither does baptism. And Paul is certainly not replacing circumcision with water baptism here. Now, 
The first question to ask when discussing water baptism is simple. Well, what is water baptism? And that's a simple question with a not so simple answer. And the answers to this question show us exactly why we should care about this topic. Because these answers show just how divisive this topic of water baptism is. That's not reason enough to drop it as a practice because it's divisive. That's not the reason we don't do it. But we also cannot ignore that fact that it is divisive when we're studying this and when we're trying to answer these questions. Well, what is water baptism? To many, it is a sacrament or a means of grace. It's a religious rite or ritual that is considered to have special significance and is believed to convey divine grace or spiritual benefit to those who participate in it. For others, it is an ordinance. It's a ritual or a ceremony that is considered sacred or symbolic within a particular faith tradition. But unlike a sacrament, an ordinance is usually not considered a conduit of grace, but simply a practice that is commanded to be performed, uh, commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ to be done. For others, water baptism is just a suggestion. You really should be baptized. And if you don't, then you're not really doing what Jesus wants you to do. And for many, it's just a symbol and nothing more. You do it if you like that sort of symbol. If it makes you feel good or you think it has value for you, then do it. But alongside that are always two necessary questions. Well, when do you baptize and why? Do you do it as a baby? If so, what if you weren't baptized as a baby, but now you believe in Jesus as an adult? Do you then get baptized, or do you, do you miss your chance? Is it okay to do it then? And if you do it as a baby, does that water baptism save the baby if he or she dies as a baby? Does it save them if they grow up and live a long life as an atheist? If it's only for adults... Is it ever done before they believe in Jesus, or is it only done after they believe? Is it done before or after that person receives the Holy Spirit? If they do it to receive the Holy Spirit, does the water baptism then grant them some sort of spiritual gift? Do you do it as an adult? in order to be a member of a particular church or denomination. And if already baptized by a different denomination or a different church, do you have to do the new churches and new denominations version of it in order to be accepted or in order to be a member? Or does any old water baptism count for that particular ecclesiastical body? Every possible answer to every one of those questions has been given. And entire denominations or sub-denominations are formed because of major and minor differences in understanding this issue. Okay, well, if you're going to be water baptized, how is it to be done? There's essentially three different modes. Is it sprinkling or is it pouring or is it submersion? If sprinkling, how many sprinkles? And should those sprinkles be holy water sprinkles or do tap water sprinkles do just fine? If it's pouring, how much is poured? And again, is it holy water or is it tap water? If it's submersion or dunking, how many dunks is it? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Is it seven? And who does the baptism? Is it the pastor? Is it the priest? Is it a friend? Is it a stranger? And where does it happen? Does it happen inside or outside? Does it happen in a baptismal tub or a river or a lake? Or does it matter? And then what words are said when the baptism takes place? Is it the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? Is it just Jesus? Is there a little ritualistic phrase that has to be recited? Or does the baptized person then give a little testimonial? Once again... All of those questions have been answered in every possible way. 
if I did water baptism, if it's something that I personally practiced, I'd want it to look like it did in the Bible. I'd want it to look like it did in the New Testament. But the vast majority of those, those questions either cannot be answered biblically, there's just not an answer in there, or what's practiced is very much unlike the New Testament in some significant way. That doesn't mean that some people don't do it closer to Scripture than others. I applaud those who try to get it as close as possible, but I'm hoping we'll come to see that nobody who really practices it is doing it in a biblical way because there's a biblical case to be made that is not for the church today at all. I mentioned that someone reading Galatians 3.27 is likely to think of water baptism when they read that verse. But there are many kinds of baptism in the Bible, and most different kinds of baptism don't involve water at all. The word baptism or baptizo means to dip or to submerge. And the idea of being submerged is sometimes a submersion, a submersion into something other than water. Every time I eat an Oreo cookie, I baptize it in the milk. All right? You can baptize into other things than water. And sometimes the word is used to symbolize that something is connected with something else. It's a term that says this thing is baptized into this thing, and so those two are connected in a meaningful way. So it's not always a, a literal dunking, if you will. Much in the same way that I could say, well, Elise is dipping her toes in. Now, I might be talking about how she slowly and daintily enters any body of water she might want to swim in, because that's what she does. She starts with her toes and usually doesn't get past that. So she dips her toes in. But I could be talking about how she's starting a new hobby. She's dipping her toes in. She's just getting started. She's feeling it out. So there's a literal meaning to that and a figurative one. Or you could also think of the word saturated. The definition of saturated is holding as much water or moisture as can be absorbed, thoroughly soaked. But I use that water-related word more often than not to refer to something that has nothing to do with water. You've heard, maybe you haven't noticed, but you've heard me use it in that way a thousand times. Saturated is one of my favorite words. I think in elementary school I can remember a spelling test, and I was asked to spell it, and I was given a hard one just to test me, and I got it right. I was so proud. So I think I've liked the word ever since then. I use it a lot, and I'm usually not talking about something actually being thoroughly soaked with water. I'll use it, uh, I'll say things like, well, this this passage or this text is saturated with this theme or this meaning. It's, it's filled with that thing. And so there's a figurative way we can use these water terms as well. Baptizo is similar. It may be water-related in most instances. In most times you see it in Scripture, it has something to do with water. If you just count how many times it's used. But that doesn't mean it's only talking about water. Again, of all the types of baptism that happen in Scripture, water is only one of them. There's plenty of others. And we won't go into that list. Uh, I was gracious enough to cut that section out of the sermon to spare us some time. But we can talk about that uh, at a different time if we want to. But of all those different types... There's water baptism, there's baptism by fire, there's all sorts of them. There's only one baptism that concerns the church, that concerns the body of Christ, that concerns us today. And that's what Paul says, that there's just one. The other baptisms, baptisms are many, but they are for Israel. Paul gives us just one. We read it earlier in Ephesians 4, and that great passage on what unites us as believers. Ephesians 4, uh, verses 4 through 6. You'll have, you should have all of these references on the sheet. I apologize if I missed one. But Ephesians 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call one Lord, one faith, 
one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now that's important because people will read that and they'll say, well, that's water baptism. But they don't necessarily realize, people don't realize that baptism is used in many other types of ways. And so it, once you realize that, you have to ask, well, which one is Paul talking about? Is he talking about baptism in fire, baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit? Which one does he mean? And you can't say, well, he means all of them. Or you can't mean they're all the same thing because then you're starting to pull apart at things like, well, there's one God and Father. Well, we don't want to touch that. We don't want to say there might be other options than just the one God and Father. We don't want to say there's more than one Lord or more than one faith. So we have to say there's one baptism. Well, which is it? Because he says there's one, but he doesn't in that text actually clarify what he means by that, which is the one baptism. Now I imagine as he's writing this to believers that he knows well, he's met, he's established these churches there. They in Galatia will probably read that, most of them, and know exactly what Paul is talking about. Because he's taught them these things before. But we have to use some detective work and we can be thankful that he does clarify it in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. He says there, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. We've got that oneness connection there. Paul's using this language, one again, one this, one this, one this. And he says we were baptized into one body. Okay, so the one baptism he's talking about is this baptism that baptizes us, submerges us, places us into one body, places us into Christ or the body of Christ. And so the one baptism that Paul talks about is not water baptism. It can't be. If it is, these two verses can't fit together. They can't mesh together. There's no way that I've seen explained well to really reconcile those verses if Ephesians 4 is talking about water. Okay, well then now who is the one who baptizes? Because in every kind of baptism, there's a baptizer. And it's not a priest, it's not a pastor, but it's the Holy Spirit himself. For in one spirit, we were all baptized. You can translate that perfectly well to say by one spirit. Whichever one seems to make sense in your head the most to make this point, I'd say go with it. But again, you have to test that on your own. And what does the Holy Spirit baptize us into? Into the one body, into Christ. It is not a submersion and identification with water. It's not being placed into water. It is being placed into and submerged into and identified with Christ and his body. And that already fits the unity that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 4. And it fits that way, way better than water. For all the reasons I alluded to earlier with all those questions, it's very hard to say water baptism is something that unites us. One God, that unites us. One Lord, being Jesus, that unites us. One faith, that unites us. One spirit, that unites us. But one water baptism does not unite us. And if that is talking about water baptism, then we have, I think, done irrevocable damage. There's no going back. There's no figuring out, well, what exactly is that supposed to mean? Of all the millions of Christians in the world, we are not connected with them and united to them in water baptism. That can't possibly be true. But we are all united in Christ. That's what we have in common. All true believers have been submerged, have been identified, have been dipped into, placed into Christ. Every one of them, whether they understood this doctrine or not, they're baptized into Christ. And that is a far more beautiful theological home to live in. Far better than hoping that our baptism was the right kind of water in the right amount and done by the right kind of person for the right reasons with the right words spoken. 
question then, and we can certainly ask, is why doesn't Paul include water baptism? We can ask and say, well, couldn't he have said, okay, hey guys, so the only baptism that really, really matters is that the Holy Spirit identifies you with Christ and places you in him in his body church, but also Jesus wants you to submerge yourselves in water for this and that reason. Well, that's a perfectly reasonable question to ask is, well, why doesn't Paul say something like that? And I think the reason is, well, he could have if that was God's will. But it's not. He doesn't teach that. God does not have him do so because water baptism primarily is a Jewish practice. So many people in the church think that water baptism is a Christian thing, that it's a New Testament thing, but it's not. It's an Old Testament thing, an Old, Old Testament thing. Water baptism is part of that list of things that Paul is warning against, those works of the law, he calls them, those things that served as boundary markers. Paul says that the Jewish dietary system is not for the body of Christ. That boundary marker is gone. He says that the Jewish rituals and festivals, those feast days, are not for the body of Christ. Boundary marker, gone. And he says that circumcision, that's the big focus. Circumcision is not for the body of Christ. That boundary marker is gone. And we should add to that list that Paul says that water baptism is not for the body of Christ. That is a boundary marker. That fits perfectly this list of boundary markers. These things that the Jewish people did in order to identify themselves as God's covenant people. But Paul doesn't really mention it, at least not very clearly, as one of those boundary markers. Well, why is that? If it is a boundary marker, if it is one of these works of the law, why doesn't Paul mention it specifically as one of those? And I think that's because this was one of the least significant to them. The dietary laws thing has a major impact on how you live your life. And the circumcision one, well, that had a major impact because other people forced it to be a major issue. Because it was the most permanent and clear boundary marker for a Jewish man to keep. And so his opponents were focused on it. They were focused on the diet, but they were really focused on circumcision. And so Paul probably doesn't bring up water baptism as a boundary marker because he doesn't have his opponents going around saying you have to be water baptized to be saved. They're going around saying you have to be circumcised to be saved. They're going around saying you can't fellowship with us if you're eating those kinds of foods. They're not really concerned with the washing rituals as much. That's not to say they're never concerned with it. Jesus has an encounter. You see that in Mark 7. Jesus encounters these Pharisees who are really picky about these washing rules, these baptism rules. But Paul doesn't seem to face that. And so he doesn't need to address it as much, though he did address it. Had Paul's opponents been focused on making Gentiles practice ritual cleanliness in order to be saved, Instead of focusing on circumcision, then perhaps Paul would have talked more about that and talked about circumcision less. And if that were the case, I doubt that we would have developed the tradition in our church of making men get circumcised as some public outward display of their inward faith. But who knows? What is fascinating is that even despite Paul's focusing on circumcision, and his point being, you don't have to do that. That's not necessary. Despite that, the vast majority of people who practice water baptism, regardless of how they do it and when they do it, they see water baptism as the new circumcision. And they claim that. You go on the message boards online, they claim it. You have conversations with them, they just claim it. They say, they'll have this debate whether you should baptize as an adult or as an infant. Pado baptists or Credo baptists they have this fight amongst themselves. And each side claims, well, you baptize babies because baptism is a new circumcision. And others will say, well, you baptize adults because it's a new circumcision. And adult converts to Judaism had to do that too. 
And what they miss is the fact that the Bible never says, hey, replace circumcision with baptism. It never says that. It's not in there. At least I don't see it. And yet that's what they think. That's the new circumcision, which immediately makes it a boundary marker, which immediately makes it something that the Apostle Paul would have fought against. And so in order to, in order to make it work, they have to make it this thing that Paul would fight against. And yet they don't see that. They don't see that what they're doing is creating a, a work, creating a boundary marker, creating something that Paul would have fought against. Which is fascinating, really. They never seem to apply Paul's teaching against requiring circumcision, then apply it to their new circumcision of baptism. It's a Jewish practice. In Exodus 19.14, it says, so Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people and they baptizo, they baptized their garments. Exodus 30 verses 17 through 21. The Lord said to Moses, you shall also make a basin of bronze with its stand of bronze for baptizing. You, you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar and you shall put water in it with which Aaron and his son shall baptize their hands and their feet. When you go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn a food offering to the Lord, they shall baptize with water. So they may not die. They shall baptize their hands and their feet so that they may not die. It shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his offspring throughout their generations. Now, that's water baptism, not as it's practiced today, but it's the washing, it's the dipping of the hands or the feet into the water. It's identifying them as priests, which is important to know. It's a practice that in part identifies Jewish priests. But it's also this baptism with water, a practice for ritual cleansing and purification. Leviticus 11 verse 25 Whoever carries any part of their carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Numbers 19.13 Whoever touches a dead person, the body of anyone who has died and does not cleanse himself, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from Israel. Because the water for impurity was not thrown on him, he shall be unclean. His uncleanness is still on him. Ritual washings were used to identify priests, and they're also connected with ritual cleanliness. To be unclean does not mean sinful. It just means you're ritually defiled, you're ritually unclean, and God has a process for restoring you to sort of right relationship in that sense. You can see that, you can see this being uh, identifying priests in Exodus 29 and Leviticus 8, which we'll skip for now, but Exodus 29 and Leviticus 8, which I put there on your sheet. But Jewish tradition added its own baptism rituals over time. With all these boundary markers, you see that they start off as one thing, and then they kind of grow to be a little bit more encompassing of daily life. In Luke 11, verse 37 and 38, it says, While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. I mentioned it earlier, but there's another fascinating text. That's Mark 7. That's a really interesting one. No, no time for it today, but Mark 7, the first seven verses there, has a similar encounter to this, but with more detail. And you can see in that story how the Pharisees sort of took the law and expanded it to include something it, it wasn't meant to include. Jews then, and even now today, Jews in the first century and now, had mikvahs, which were these small, square, little pools for ritual water baths for purification and conversion to the faith. And you would approach it. You would approach this square little pool. You can think of maybe like a hot tub size, a little bit smaller maybe, or about the same size. Maybe a square in the ground, and you would walk up to it. You would disrobe. I'm not sure exactly how naked you'd get. You might have underwear on. You might not. I forget. But you'd disrobe, 
You'd walk down the steps into the water, and there'd be steps on the other side. You'd walk out, and then you put your robe back on. Those were the mikvahs, and they had a little system there so that the water was always running because there had to be running water for it to, to count. And so that's what they did. They had the mikvahs. There wasn't any fuss. There wasn't any confusion. It was just ritual cleansing. And they had these set up all over. You can see them in archaeological digs, these mikvahs. And it's, it's very interesting because they have a couple of them in major towns, not hidden away in a synagogue somewhere. They didn't just go to the river. They had these set up like this because it was something you did often. It wasn't something you did once. It's something you did often. Unless you were converting to Judaism, then, then you would wash. You would be baptized which is interesting because you, then you look at the apostles and what they do after the ministry of Jesus, saying repent and be baptized. They're essentially asking them to convert and to repent and to be ritually clean in a Jewish sense because it's a Jewish practice in a Jewish ministry. The apostle Paul doesn't use that kind of language, at least not as much. But in this way, through this mikvah, they're identified not even primarily with water, but they identify themselves with obedience to the law. This is the sort of thing that it's happening throughout the Gospels. Christians too often see water baptism happening there, and they assume that what is happening is baptism as they know it and understand it. And then that reinforces the idea that they ought to be baptized the way that they know and understand it. And so it becomes a sort of circular reasoning there. This is an issue of, at the heart of it, rightly and accurately handling Scripture, rightly dividing Scripture. What is for Israel and what is for the church? The root cause of all this confusion is that so many people do not properly see the distinction between Israel and the body of Christ. That's going back to those essentials of mid-Acts dispensational theology. We've talked about these before. That Israel is different from the body of Christ. That the dispensation of law is different from the dispensation of grace. And Jewish water baptism is different from Paul's one baptism of Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12. That one baptism for us is done by the Spirit. The Jews going through the mikvahs, they're doing that on their own. They just walk in and walk out. And we are associated, not with a mikvah, but we are associated with the grave. Colossians 2, verses 10 through 12. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Again, most people read that and they think, oh, water baptism is what's being taught talk about there but it's not it's it's whole different kind of baptism it's this baptism not of submersion into water but if anything submersion into dirt it's this idea of burial but it's it's symbolic in a lot of ways it's a better word i guess would be to say it's spiritual paul makes it clear that there's no actual circumcision for believers today all that stuff about circumcision he makes it very clear you're circumcised not physically but spiritually He's emphasizing a spiritual circumcision. And the baptism he references is spiritual as well. He'd be mixing things up a bit if he said the circumcision is spiritual, but the baptism is physical. It's water there. It doesn't quite fit. We are spiritually crucified with Christ. We are spiritually buried with Christ. And we are spiritually resurrected with Christ. The physical death is yet to come. Same with the burial and resurrection. Romans chapter 6, 
And this is so often used during water baptism sort of ceremonies. Uh, Colossians 2 as well, but Romans 6. And one of my favorite passages here. Romans 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, not into water, into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Again, not into water, into death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That's a beautiful passage there. We have effectively, but not physically and literally, been submerged into the earth only to rise again. We do not walk into the mikvah and out. We are placed into the tomb by the Holy Spirit. We are placed into the tomb and then we walk out like spiritual Lazarus. For Paul, baptism is about identification. We do not need to be identified by water as priests, like the Jews who were to become a kingdom of priests. When you see in the New Testament all of these Jews being baptized, part of that, I think, is a fulfillment of that. That baptism, I think, in part identifies them as priests. It's looking forward to this era that was paused, was put on hold, where the Jewish people will be like priests of the world, that massive evangelical or evangelism movement that's to come from Israel. That's them acting as priests. That water identifies them like it did Aaron and his sons as priests. There's so much more that could be said. Again, I cut quite a bit out, but uh, it wouldn't really be worth the time right now to go into depth anymore because you are either sort of the proverbial choir that I'm preaching to and you know this stuff. You've studied it, you've accepted the ideas, you know it better than I do probably. And you are equipped to ask further questions if you have them. And I might be equipped to answer them, I don't know. Or you're not part of that proverbial choir and these ideas are new to you or foreign to you. And if that's the case, I've already risked throwing too much at you to digest it all. And so we're not going to go into too much more detail or any more detail, really. We'll stop there. But before we close, two brief encouragements, one for the choir and one for those who are new to these teachings or, or maybe those who have heard it before but are appreciating maybe the refresher. To those who are new, for you I'd ask that you humbly pray about this doctrine and that you would test the scriptures. Because I'm, I'm really asking you to go out on a limb there and kind of trust me a bit and maybe believe something that I've already told you less than 1% of Christians believe and it's more like 1% of 1% really. It's a vast minority. It's a strange view in the eyes of the church as a whole. And the only thing that really unites those who practice water baptism on this issue is those few of us black sheep who present to them this view that they've never heard of and make them go, huh? Uh, it's not easy to go against the grain, so be sure you've studied this if you're starting to feel convicted on this. And if not, that's okay, too. If I sound like a loon to you, that's just fine. I'm sure it's not the first time. For those of us who know this doctrine well, who have long appreciated it, I'd ask that you be careful. At times, we risk becoming legalistic about even our anti-legalism doctrines. Sometimes we can reject water baptism so strongly that we further separate ourselves from other believers that we break fellowship with people, or we allow it to become a stumbling block in that relationship. Our view is the one that should most unite people, because it sort of skips past all the division. In practice, that's not exactly how it works out, but yet, yet we as fallen people, as stubborn people, as people who feel like we know Scripture pretty well, we can be divisive at times. 
and will scorn or judge those who believe differently. I've seen that firsthand. And that becomes tiring, especially on this issue, because as we scorn or judge those who believe differently, we find that we're doing that to 99% of the believers we know. When someone you know and love is baptized in water, praise the Lord. That's the appropriate response there. Not for a misunderstanding of doctrine, but because that usually means that he or she is going through something incredible. That God is doing something miraculous in their hearts. And so for that, we praise him. We thank him. And we forgive doctrinal errors just as God will forgive ours. Years ago, when I was in high school, some kids in the youth group went on a mission trip to New York. Uh, I think they're working at a camp for kids with various mental or physical uh, disabilities. I didn't go, so I don't know exactly what they were doing. But the Sunday after they returned, the church gave them a time to share about their experiences. And I remember this moment vividly. It's one of my most vivid memories of sitting in church there in Muskegon at then Berean Church. And I remember it because Carla got up to share and she grabbed the microphone. And Carla was this girl whose parents are really strong GGF people. They, they know the doctrine well. And her dad was a board member and is right now, I think, maybe the chairman of the board at the church. And she started sharing about the beautiful moment while she was on this trip when she was water baptized. And I knew the position of the church, and I saw the youth pastor's face sort of fill with a nervous fear because he wasn't expecting her to share that part of the trip. And I was sitting in the second row of pews where everybody should want to sit. You guys can feel free to come forward anytime. And I was sitting in the second row of pews, and I turned around to get a glimpse of some of the scornful looks on people's faces now that they found out that the youth pastor let this girl and maybe others get baptized. And what I saw was smiles, and what I saw was a few tears of joy, and what I saw was people being really moved by this young girl's testimony, which wasn't what I was expected based on experiences I'd had in the past. And that was surprising to me, and I feel bad that that was surprising to me. I feel bad that I didn't expect more of those great people there in Muskegon. But that's the kind of grace people we need to be. We need to be all about grace, about receiving it certainly, but also about giving it. Even when God works in ways we don't expect, even when people look at how dry we are and say, well, that's strange, that's a cult, certainly. Even when someone says, I want to be baptized. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for my baptism. Lord, I've never been water baptized. The only baptism I mean is that baptism into Christ. I thank you for each believer here, each believer hearing this, for their baptism into Christ, the one that I know that really counts. And the one that most people who do water baptism, if they're pressed on it, will say, well, that's the one that most counts too. And Lord, I appreciate that humility and that graciousness. I'm thankful, Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, that I could be crucified already and still stand here today, perhaps feeling a bit under the weather, but certainly certainly not having experienced the actual pain of crucifixion. Lord, that I could be crucified, that I could be buried, that I could have already been resurrected. What a beautiful and profound truth that, that Lord, I don't know if I'll ever truly, fully grasp. Lord, I ask that you would help us all to enjoy the benefits and the blessings of saying, Lord, I have died to my sin and I now live in Christ, that Christ lives in me, that through Christ living in me, I now have a hope of glory, of eternal life, and not just a hope that looks forward, but a hope that began the moment I first believed. That in that moment of first belief, I was baptized into Christ. I was identified in his death, but also identified in his resurrection. That now, today, in this moment, I can live a resurrected life. 
not totally free from the chains of sin that still in, occasionally entangle me, but knowing that I am ultimately free in Christ, that my salvation that was begun in that moment will be completed, that there is no stopping it, there is no turning back, that this is a resurrection from crucifixion into new life, that that resurrection cannot be undone, that that death cannot be undone, that I eternally stand identified with Christ. Lord, I pray that this would be an encouragement to all of us as we go forward to be ambassadors, to be light, to share the gospel, to praise you when our friends outside of this grace movement, when they get baptized, Lord, to stand alongside them and say, praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, help us to be gracious and loving in all things, but also, when necessary, to speak the truth in love. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.